Our second speaker is Sonia Alvarez. Sonia is a professor of Latin American politics and director of the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Sonia's areas of specialization are social movements and protest politics and comparative and transnational feminisms. Sonia's recent co-edited books include Translocalities, Translocalidades, Feminist Politics of Translation in Latina Americas, and Beyond Civil Society Agenda, Activism, Participation, and Protest in Latin America in Press. Welcome, Sonia. I want to start out by, I'm very, very, very glad to be here um, to talk about these issues with um, uh, new and old friends. I want to thank Janet and all the organizers for the kind invite. Um, I still have a great deal to learn uh, about assemblage thinking since I only relatively recently began to see it as a promising analytic uh, for rethinking and reimagining activism, uh, participation, and protest, particularly in the 2010s or since the 2010s. So what I'm going to do is do my best to do justice to our specific charge for this session, addressing two core problematics of the symposium, as well as touching on some of the questions posed in the concept paper that Janet and her co-authors prepared for this event. I, too, have a prepared text, and in the interest of time, I'm going to read more than I like to, but I'll move in and out of the text as much as I can without running too far over time. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is first um, talk to you all about the alternative conceptual framework, discursive fields of action, which I deploy to rethink social movements, or as I prefer to say, uh, rethink activism, participation, and protest, kind of breaking down the notion of social movements as a unified whole by uh, breaking it down into those three things in the late 20th and uh, first decades of the 21st century. Second, as per our assignment for this opening session, I'll explore the utility of assemblage thinking for studying transnational, translocal social movements, specifically the post um, 2010 ensemble, and I'll suggest that because social movements are not totalities, much less pre-given or static ones, assemblage thinking helps us better apprehend how, when, and why their parts, components, elements, actants come together and move apart, assemble, and reassemble without undoing the assemblage. Whereas uh, it's usually thought that the withdrawal of a set of parts um, is, is, is said to compromise or even end a social movement. Third, I'll try to explore the similarities and differences between uh, the post-2010 assemblage and other pre-existing transnational social movement ensembles, uh, particularly transnational feminisms in my case. Uh, here, I'll suggest that global, act, global act, that, I'm sorry, that the global in activism, participation, and protest today is more part of um, the, radical, the radical imagination, as Alex Kaznabish puts it in his paper for this workshop, than it is a set of ongoing networked practices. Drawing in the experiences of post-2010 um, feminist activists in Brazil, I will also propose that translocal assemblages may be more characteristic of today's feminist and other types of activism, especially if compared with the feminist activisms typical in or of the heyday of anti-globalization, which were more often formally organized and transnationally, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, formally linked and, and, and organized transnationally and were connected to what Lynn Phillips and Sally Cole referred to as distinctive feminist flows that emerged from two translations of feminism that emerged in the late neoliberal era, the, what they call the UN orbit and the another world um, translation. Each was deep, deeply, as these terms uh, imply, each was deeply intertwined with the UN world summits and the world social forum process respectively. Though today's translocal feminist assemblages also cross national borders in many cases, they are typically not transnational in the linked or network sense that these late 20th century fields were. I will offer examples from Brazil's Slutwalk, anarcho-autonomous feminist organizing, and recent organizing among Afro-descendant women to illustrate the translocality of contemporary globally-minded feminisms. Um, 
So first a few words, can you read that? Yeah, first a few words about my alternative conceptualization that I'm gonna do very much in brief here of the notion of um, social movement or my rethinking of that notion. The political grammar I've been working with for some time now in analyzing the shifting dynamics of what we normally call social movements, feminist movements in particular, largely turns on this notion of discursive fields of action. It actually, by the way, for those of you who know Bourdieu and theories of fields and so on and so forth, um, much of my thinking on fields is derived not from that tradition, uh, but from Brazilian intellectual activists who began to develop this notion way back in the 1980s. I'd never even uh, read Bourdieu, actually, when I first started using the term fields to think about movements. Discursive fields of action are much more than a mere agglomeration of what sociologists call SMOs or social movement organizations. They encompass a wide variety of individual and collective actors and of cultural and political sites and, na and, and local, national, translocal, and global scales. Discursive fields of action are both formally and informally articulated through reticulate webs. Uh, these not only connect social movement organizations and NGOs, but also interconnect individuals and more or less formalized groupings situated in diverse spaces and places, whether in civil society, in uncivic society, um, which is most often politically articulated in the streets and in the countryside, which I like to call civil society's other, political society, the state, intergovernmental organizations, the academy, cultural industries, the mainstream media, alternative media, these are all sites in which activism happens. Um, and we need to map that activism as it happens outside that sphere that we normally think of as the sphere of social movements and civil society. Um, that's harder to read. Activist fields, are, I just put this together in the hotel room like a while before we came, so I didn't get to play with it much. Activist fields are wo woven together through multi-level, multi-layered, and continuous crossings of people's practices and ideas, virtual and real. Because of this, feminist fields are always in movement. The boundaries of who or what is properly a feminist are imposed and constantly policed by actors who establish themselves as hegemonic in a given moment or context. But they are also constantly challenged and reshaped through political struggle, contestation, translation, and reappropriation. Fields are also articulated discursively, that is, through shared, though continuously contested, languages, meanings, and worldviews. This idea of worldviews will come back as an important feature of these things. Uh, indeed, political and discursive contestation and the contestation, contention and the contestation of meanings and power are constitutive elements of feminist fields. My most recent re-immersion in the fields of feminism in Brazil during a long sabbatical um, in 2013-2014 triggered a further conceptual realignment in my thinking about this stuff. Recent developments in Afro-Brazilian feminist politics in particular prompted me to think about ontological politics or better emergent feminist fields, distinct activist fields grounded in different worlds and thus in distinctive views from those worlds. So not different views of the same world, but distinctive views from different worlds, from being positioned literally in different worlds. Um, so, uh, furthermore, feminist discourses are today multiplying at a vertiginous rate, and people who call themselves feminists engage in a truly dazzling array of action. Feminisms are now arguably not only plural, but multi-sided, often translocal, and internally hyper-heterogeneous. The, boundary the boundaries or parameters whose incessant disputation and reconfiguration were to my mind constitutive of late 20th century feminist fields are today arguably so diffuse so mutable, moving so swiftly, so as to make it close to impossible to even dispute them political, politically, and also making it all the more challenging to theorize them adequately, let alone map them or trace them empirically. And these multiple places and spaces of feminist activism combine and recombine, clash, rebound, and reassemble with others or with one another in often transmuted forms. Feminism, feminist activism then is not just rhizomatic in the sense of that it seems to be in similar ways 
popping up in different ways, but I think it rather looks and feels more like what many have theorized as assemblages, and I'm gonna say more about that in a moment. But first I wanna share with you a couple of stories about emergent feminist fields in Brazil and what I'm tentatively beginning to um, think of as, as feminist activist, translocal feminist activist assemblages. The first I'm gonna talk about is um, the Marcha das Vadias, Brazil's version of the now global slut walk ensemble, um, which you're very familiar with here since it started in neighboring t Toronto. Um, the slut walk has mobilized tens of thousands of young women in Brazil, as well as trans feminists and solidary gay and straight young men in dozens of Brazilian cities since um, its first edition in 2011. Literally, emb li literally embodying their feminisms by emblazoning gender non-conforming, queer, anti-racist, pro-social justice, and trans-inclusive slogans on their bodies, the Vajia's rebellion, uh, rebellious public defiance of, of cultural gender norms um, brazenly enacts a radical cultural politics. Why the term Vajia's? In one rendition from the Marcha in the city of San Carlos in the interior of the state of San Paulo, a uh, woman once said, we appropriated this term slut because we realize that it is a word used to, used to address us women when we demonstrate a kind of attitude of freedom, especially sexual freedom. If, it, if, it, if being free means being a slut, then we are all sluts. We live in a world that is scandalized by strong words, but not by violence against women. Gleciane Ferreira, a vadia from the Coletivo de Vagabundas do Desterro, and even in Brazil they use different words besides vadia, besides slut, to, in each of the local marches. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a group from the southern city of Florianópolis, which is my hometown in Brazil. Um, she explains that the use of the term itself triggered extensive debate among feminists and critics alike. She argues that much like the North American experience, which sought to extract another connotation from the term queer, the struggle for the resignification of the term vagia, commonly used in Brazil as an expression of mockery and name calling, was one of the principal objectives of the marchas. A global radical imaginary is clearly at work here. Yet though slut walk is now an activist, uh, global activist modality in Brazil and as, and as in many other parts of the world, it is organized independently of other slut walks, even those in other parts of the same country. It is thus a translocal assemblage, emergent from the multiple crossings, the temporary entanglements among marchas in different Brazilian cities as activists and their mobilizational paraphernalia, um, like posters, images, chants, etc., travel and reassemble among dispersed sites. The Brazilian marcha was enacted, has enacted cultural interventions that along with the effusive anarcha-feminist scene, the extensive feminist hip-hop crowd, the blog blogueiras feministas or feminist bloggers, the blogueiras negras or black, bl black women bloggers, the girls rock scene, Minas do Rock, uh, and many other ludic cultural political expressions emergent in recent years signal the growing popularization of feminism among new generations of activists. Most of these activists, um, ex most of these activist expressions are articulated virtually and translocally, and like the Marcha das Vadias, also translate and reappropriate global discourses and activist practices that travel virally. Um, like the Marcha das Vadias, a wide range of other expressions of today's multi-streamed, hyper-heterogeneous feminisms are bent on undermining dominant power uh, formations through innovative cultural interventions. One uh, novel recent feminist organizing modality is the festival, a format that a group of activists who were organizing the first Antifest Suspiring Feminista, which was an anti-festival um, sigh of feminism, is the, what the literal translation would be, in Belo Horizonte explained, uh, these are supposed to be more fluid, less structured than the now traditional feminist encuentros or encounters of yesterday year. It is something much less academic, they said, kind of do it yourself. It's contact with the streets, getting, getting together and doing it for ourselves. It's a feminist breath of fresh air 
in the midst of machista violence and life's messiness. It's an attempt to practice together feminist ways of relating to one another and to construct autonomous zones of resistance. For a flavor of their cultural political agenda, suffice it to say that the Anarcha Autonomous event featured vegan cooking, shows, debates about transfeminism, feminist activism against the prison industrial complex, discussion, uh, discussions of Afro hair and binarisms, Zine launchings, workshops on self-defense, gordophobia or fatphobia, and cuerpa, a gender queer reference to the body, FTM, uh, do-it-yourself sexual brinquedas, a queer gender reference to sex toys, and spanking, among others. The Antifest uh, was inspired by a similar fe festival, this is the one you're looking at here, uh, held yearly in Salvador Bahia between 2010 and 2013, the Festival Vuva La Vida, uh, whose third edition, I, I assume you know the, the, what that means. It's not hard, not, not a big stretch. Uh, those third, uh, this, those third, third edition slogan was proudly feminist, necessarily inconvenient. Uh, the public call for the meeting posted through social media and on their website described the event as follows. It is a feminist countercultural festival. Through do-it-yourself ethics, we believe that change does not depend on the initiative of political parties and institutions. We should practice it daily, developing new values for relations caught up in daily life. This implies thinking our more intimate habits, rethinking our more intimate habits, making revolution both in the streets and in bed. Politics is also fun. Still, some Afro-Brazilian feminists critique the Marcha das Vagias and other, other, in their view, predominantly white majority middle class expressions of feminist cultural transgressions, such as the Festivais, for their difficulty in dealing with black women's specificity and demand that anti-racism cease to be a facile verbiage and become a quotidian practice embraced by everyone, according to one interviewee. One black feminist and organizer of the Vajias in Salvador argued that, quote, racism labels us as sluts and whores from the day we were born because of race. Historical racism seized and imprisoned us within our sexuality, and that's something that for years black women's struggles have been working to reconstruct, to deconstruct. I want to suggest that black women's movements in Brazil today should be seen in themselves to constitute an extensive discursive field of action composed of diverse strands. Um, the Black Women's March Against Racism and the Black Women's March Against, I have a feeling I'm behind my slides, uh, against racism, violence, and for living well is a process that advances an innovative methodology which recognizes that diversity. This was held in Brasilia in November of last year. The story I'll tell you about it is meant to illustrate the configuration of a distinctive emergent translocal Afro-Brazilian feminist field, one that, that one was sometimes discordant, yet also often recombinant parts that constitute a complex assemblage. It is inserted in and sometimes recombines with translocal assemblages like the Badias and Anarca Feminist Festivais through the territorializing and re-territorializing dynamics that configure and reconfigure Brazilian feminist politics today. Um, in, held in Brasilia on November 18th, 2015, the actual march on the nation's capital, which according to varying reports, drew between five to 20,000 women and perhaps a few hundred men from across Brazil, was the culmination of an unprecedented nationwide um, an unprecedented uh, nationwide mobilization uh, process uh, that spanned several years uh, and encompassed all regions of the country. Uh, it considering, uh, considered a major turning point, a veritable watershed in Afro-Brazilian women's activism by organizers, participants, and observers alike. The Marcha involved every conceivable sector of Afro-descendant women's organizing and many activists from, mixed gender, uh, black, from the mixed gender black movement as well. Um, though many black women, how am I for time? I have no idea. Two, three, Two, three minutes. I'm going to have to jump through a lot of this. Uh, the point is that the Marsha uh, was able through, um, can I, well, the Marsha was able to, um, it's just, this is the part that, that's text, um, draw in, its slogan was, come and march with us. And the idea was precisely to reach out to women who were organizing 
uh, in every sector of Brazilian, black women who were organizing in every sector of society and bring them towards the march. And local groupings of the march that affiliated with the march did all kinds of fundraising activities and cultural activities and political activities and so on to fit, raise f money and awareness so that they could participate in the big march in Brasilia. But that process arguably was much more important than the big march in Brasilia in terms of consolidating or, or, or creating uh, an assemblage of some movement assemblage of sort of an, uh, an activist assemblage of people who don't normally interact with one another in an ongoing way. Um, you know, so you have, you had from, um, you had, you know, everything from Mais de Santo, uh, from traditional Afro, um, uh, uh, Brazilian religions uh, to, uh, you know, radical lesbian feminist um, anarchists to trade unionists to uh, liberal professionals to former politicians or current politicians. It, you know, so there's this broad uh, spectrum of people who uh, seldom come together. Um, in, in, in Importantly, there was also a major a presence, an unprecedented presence of people from the north and northeast, which is the the blackest and not coincidentally the poorest uh, region of Brazil. Uh, whereas normally in these kinds of things, people from the wealthier south and southeast sort of control the, the dynamics of the assemblage. Um, and they were organizing transnationally with other women in the Amazon, and they were the ones that brought in this idea of, of living well, so the march was called F Against Racism, Racism Against Violence and For Living Well. And I thought, wait a minute, this isn't Bolivia. Why are they talking about living well? Uh, and it turns out that it was from Andean women, women that had interacted with black women in the Amazon, of which there are many and, and seldom are they understood to be there, uh, that, that this kind of idea, so this idea of, of be living well became for them, for the Black Women's March, a kind of civilizational pact that in itself signals uh, or provides evidence of the distinctive discourses that constitute this um, emergent Afro-Brazilian feminist field. Um, the Marsha process as distinct from the event in Brasilia might be understood as an emergent modality of feminist activism, one that leads me to believe that assemblage thinking is a useful way of apprehending feminism in, the, in movement today. And this part is essential for sort of our theoretical considerations. Uh, the Marsha brought together rearranged local and national fields of Afro-Brazilian women's activism the Afro-Brazilian sex workers, black domestic workers, and Afro-descendant trade unionists who came together during the march don't necessarily engage one another discursively in an ongoing way, either virtual or real. But they nonetheless combine and recombine, assemble and reassemble in diverse activist fora like those emergent through the Marsha process. Assemblage, as Colin McFarland points out, um, it, I'm sorry, it's Colin, um, uh, Colin McFarland notes, points to dispersion and transformation, processes often overlooked in network accounts. The notion emphasizes gathering, coherence, and dispersion, he says, drawing attention to the work of assembling and reassembling social material practices that are diffuse, tangled, and contingent. It shifts our analytical gaze towards, quote, spatiality and temporality, elements that are drawn together at a particular conjuncture only to disperse or realign. As Martin Mueller suggests, we can think of assemblages as a mode of ordering heterogeneous entities so that they work together for a certain time. Jeff Juris here makes a useful distinction between, that many of you are no doubt familiar with, between the logic of networking, and a cultural framework that helps give rise to practices of communication and coordination across diversity and differences on the part of collective actors, and a logic of aggregation which involves the assembling of masses of individuals from diverse backgrounds with, within physical spaces. Whereas the use, uh, the listservs and websites he goes on in movements for global, in the movements for global justice during the 1990s and 2000s helped to generate and diffuse distributed network lodges, he arg logics, he argues, 
in the Occupy movements, social media have contributed to powerful logics of aggregation, which have committed to, to have, I'm sorry, which have continued to exist alongside rather than entirely displacing network logics. I'm, I'm just trying to rattle through this, so I'm sorry if I'm bumbling a bit. Anyway, jurists, like jurists, I want to conclude by suggesting that activist fields and assemblages exist along one an alongside rather alongside one another rather than entirely displacing one another. The existence of assemblages does not imply a new era of collective action in which discursive fields of action have disappeared. Rather, assemblages can and do sediment into activist fields and fields can and do melt into assemblages, if you will. The same is true for the local, uh, the translocal and the transnational. The translocal is not that there aren't instances of transnational organizing, as I suggested, even within the March process, which was primarily a translocal process. In closing, I want to suggest that thinking fields and assemblages might help us get beyond tired sociological debates about the cyclical ebb and flow, rise and decline of protests and social movements, whether local, national, translocal, or, or transnational. Enabling alternative reimagining, uh, uh, the, uh, an alternative reimagining that may assuage endless activist hand wringing about the state of the movement. Um, is it dead or alive, peaking, receding, in abeyance, institutionalized, co opted, autonomous, subversive, effective, successful, ineffectual, disastrous, etc.? Such questions, both activist and academic ones, are based on a certain objectification or thingification of social movements. Uh, their shared analytical point of departure is, is that we already know what movements are, what they look like, how to spot one when we see one, and that we even know where we'll find them. Typically, the answer is that we'll find them in the streets protesting, right? All of these classic questions assume that social movements constitute pre-given predefined totalities that can readily be identified and demarcated empirically, and that social movements are discrete objects, clearly situated and anchored in, in space and time. Both the notion of discursive fields of action and activist assemblages, I've tried to suggest, moves beyond, move us beyond these questions to pose different ones, prompting us to jettison the taken for grantedness of mainstream social movement studies and to pursue alternative means and methods for tracing and tracking social materiality, territorializations and deterritorializations, internal and external topographies of activism, participation, and protest. There, I thought, I hope that made some sense.